All right. Take us away, sir. All right. Uh, what's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda and uh, Danny Abdeljabar. Uh, we're also okay. joined by uh, Joseph Solis Mullen. Joseph, I got it right this time, right? It's close Solis. enough. Solis. 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 Yeah. Man, I, Henry screws up everyone's so, names. It does. He's he screwed up my yeah. name for like the first year of our podcast, and we've known each other for many years before that. So, you know. Yeah, we've known each other for like ten <laughs> years at this point, and I still <laughs> get his name incorrectly. Um, so it is just my cross to bear. But, you know, speaking about my family, my family is just like the worst in general in pronouncing people's names. Like my mom will call me Thomas all the time. That's her brother. My mom will call me Stephanie sometimes. That's my sister. <laughs> wow. She really messed up that this pronunciation. Day. Like Thomas, so like Stephanie. I'm like, mom, you can't even get like my gender, gender correct. Right? Come on. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, today we're talking about China, Taiwan, maybe a bunch of other things. I think this is going to be a little bit of a different format. Um, Danny is in a new apartment where it looks like um, it looks like you just moved in somewhere. I guess that's why uh, you yeah. just moved in there. And, and um, as heads up, there's construction some going construction. outside, there's, so yeah. there may be some loud noises in the background. So Hammering. forgive us, forgive us if it's not top-notch audio as it usually is. Um, however, um, a lot of things to, to talk about. Uh, Joseph obviously has a tremendous uh, wealth of knowledge, and we really loved speaking with him uh, a couple of episodes ago. I think it was like a month and a half ago. So I guess we'll just kick this off and, and talk about a uh, paper or no, a, a article that Joseph uh, recently published. And I read this on the Libertarian Institute about Taiwan – and comparing Taiwan to the Falkland Wars. And I just want to just preface this real quick that I know very little about the Falkland Wars. And before we were even uh, like meeting up to talk, Danny said this, I had to Google where Falkland Islands were. I had no idea where they were. <laughs> so I, I, I think really we need it. to deal with this <laughs> level of knowledge, with this base yeah. level of people's common knowledge about the Falkland Wars, because my knowledge has just been, it's been like, oh, that was a staging ground for some Margaret Thatcher political man maneuver. Um, but I guess I'll just let you kind of take it from here, Joseph. Like, what's this What's this article about? And, uh, you know, what makes the Falkland Island Wars between Britain and, and uh, Argentina and, uh, I guess, a potential war um, in, in Taiwan between the United States and China? Okay, thanks, Henry. Uh uh, thanks for having me back, uh, Danny and Henry both. Uh, I really enjoy talking to you guys. Um, I did assume that most people would have very little background knowledge on this war. And the reason that I chose to write a paper about this is because there are a lot of parallels. And it's not just that I noticed them. It's that um, Chinese military planners have noticed them and have been studying uh, the Falklands War for about 25 years now. Um, actually, the Center for Strategic Studies, part of the Army uh, College, uh, they've written numerous papers and articles about it. So it's it, it is it is a very out of the way place. It was a very small conflict. It lasts 74 days from start to finish. It was a blip on the Cold War radar. So most people don't know about it. And the conflict itself isn't that important for what it did, which, as you said, it, it basically destroyed the junta in Argentina and guaranteed that Margaret Thatcher would get reelected. Um, but in terms of the parallels that there, there really aren't any parallels even close to as analogous uh, to the situation in between uh, the mainland and Taiwan as the Falklands Malvinas War. And so I just wanted to start with giving just a touch of background because most people don't know where the Falklands are, aren't aware that there was even a war in 1982. So the Falkland Islands are at the very southern tip of the cone of South America. Uh, they're on the east side. They're about 900 miles north of the Arctic, of the Antarctic Circle. So it's basically a pile of rocks. It's a few hundred small islands. There's two main islands, East and West Falklands. Um, basically, there weren't even any indigenous peoples there. I mean, they're very cold, very wet, poor soil. Basically, uh, as the age of exploration got underway, um, multiple uh, European explorers came upon these islands. 
and for the the first basically 150 years from about the mid 17th century to the late 18th century uh, it changed hands between the spanish the french the british and basically what happens is the british i'm going to cut that that part out because there's just a lot of back and forth there but basically the british are there and it's kind of out of the way it's not that important and the revolutionary war happens and they need to divert resources to go fight a bunch of angry americans and so they leave but they leave this little plaque behind that says hey this is our island so don't even think about it uh and they mean to come right back but of course the american revolution takes a long time then they get that wrapped up and the wars of the french revolution start and then the napoleonic wars start and in the meantime of course during the napoleonic wars uh, Napoleon invades Spain and deposes the monarch there, which sets off all the revolutions in South America. So uh, the United Providence, Provinces of the Rio de la Plata, based in Buenos Aires, this is uh, basically Argentina. I'm just going to start calling it Argentina just to avoid any confusion. Um, they basically allow this merchant named Verne to go to the islands and start running it as a commercial hub. And this is in the late 18 teens. And the British are kind of like, yeah, whatever. He has some permission and everything. Um, there's some whaling and things going on around there, sealing, different things like that. Uh, basically, the British find out that Vernet has been appointed the governor of the island by the Buenos Aires elite. And that sets the British over the edge. And so they sail down there with a ship. It's 1830 by now. So they don't really have a lot going on. And so they basically kick, kick them off the island, take over. And in 1840, they make it an official crown colony. And that's basically how things stay for the next hundred years. Um, the Argentines never give up their claim to the island, but uh, they're squaring off against uh, Britain, uh, the most powerful empire in the world. At and the they don't have any interest in fighting mm -hmm. uh, the British, obviously. And so the British basically control the islands for the next 150 years or 100 years. And in 1945 at the UN, uh, Argentina brings up its claim again. Um, the British still say no way. They're still under the illusion that they can keep their empire. Things haven't started completely falling apart yet. Um, basically by the 1960s, the situation is radically changing uh, for Great Britain. Um, things are just completely falling apart. Um, they've suffered tremendously economically. Um, their population's been devastated by the Second World War. They never really recovered from the First World War. But essentially what happens is the UN says, OK, we want you guys to figure out this dispute because the Argentinians are getting much more vocal. It starts during the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, the Peronist governments start saying that these are our islands. We never look, look at a map. Look at a map. Come on. It's right next to us. It's about 100 miles from the shore. So and Taiwan is 80 miles from the shore of mainland China. So like, it's very, very close. Similar. These are very, mm -hmm. very similar situations here. And very similar also, you have a protector who's thousands of miles away. Um, so basically, uh, the labor government of the 1960s are pretty okay with this idea. Uh, they don't have a lot of money. It's kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, they're okay with figuring out a way to transfer uh, the Falklands into the Argentinian orbit. The people who are not cool with that are the Falklanders themselves. They consider themselves British. Um, there have been several really great books written about the war, but one of them that was really good, the, the fellow's name is escaping me at the moment, but he wrote an entire book basically talking about um, the imagined community aspect. Um, hmm. sort of oh, Benedict Anderson, Anderson, or is that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That basically, um, yeah, we, we... yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, no, like we had talked about with Benedict Anderson and the whole idea of an imagined community. They said, look, we're we're English. We're, we're British. We speak English. We have the same traditions, the same heritage. We want to be part of, of the UK. We don't want to be part of Argentina. And so this is basically what happens here is you you reach this stalemate where Great Britain, uh, you know, the basically what happens is the Falklanders establish a political lobby, which should sound familiar. Um, Taiwan, of course, has a very active lobby in the United States, right? You need to have lobbyists to keep your government uh, interested in this very far away place that, you know, it isn't immediately clear why it's important that you should be devoting resources to it. And the Falklands lobby is very, very successful in keeping the British public on the side of Falklanders are 
Britishers. They're they're part of the empire. And so basically what happens is, yes, the population uh, does think that, but the British government is faced with a lot of economic constraints. And so they start sending signals that the Argentinian government takes to mean they won't fight if the Argentinians invade the island. So first, they basically scrap the only ship that they have patrolling the region. And then in 1981, they update the Nationality Act, and they basically make the Falklanders like second-class citizens, basically limiting their ability to emigrate into the UK. And so all of these signals that, you know, the government clearly isn't all that committed to it. Look, they're they're removing resources from here. They're basically downgrading the status of Falklanders as British citizens. One of the reason, reasons that the Falklanders were so resistant uh, by that time was because, of course, in 1976, uh, the Argentinian government is overthrown by a military junta, and they kick off uh, what's called the Dirty War. And I don't know how much your listeners are familiar with uh, the history of that period, but tens of thousands of, of political opponents to the military regime are tortured, murdered, disappeared. Um, this is not something that anyone wants to be a part of, right? And so at the same time, the Argentinians are clamoring, the Argentinian government is clamoring to get the Falklands back. The Falklanders are saying, we want nothing to do with your government, with your way of, of doing things. So basically, the situation gets very bad. Uh, this is something we talked about in our conversation about China, where I think the greatest uh, risk to Taiwan is if the social and economic situation deteriorates in China, that the obvious solution is to go invade Taiwan. And that's exactly the solution that uh, the Argentinian junta hit on. Well, there's a lot of social unrest, a lot of economic poor performance going on. I know what we'll do. We'll go invade the Falklands. Good old fashioned invasion. We'll distract everyone, get their patriotism all riled up. We'll boot the imperialists out, um, which is kind of, you know, my 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 grandpa actually made the point that, like, you know, they're, they're both kind of imperialists in, in this sense. You know, it was an uninhabited right. island. You know, they're mm -hmm. both just making these extraterritorial ter claims. But right. basically, they just misjudge the situation. They misjudge the political incentive structure that the British government would face because, again, the Falklands lobby for years had been paying people to write editorials, paying MPs, putting pressure on the government to make sure the Falklands stayed inside the empire. And so Margaret Thatcher really, uh, there's a great public outcry, tons of support for going and trying to take it back. And that's exactly what happens. And so that's kind of the background to the conflict. So I got, just I got so everyone some... is on the same page. <clears throat> Yeah, I got some questions because uh, yeah. you un you unloaded a lot of stuff on there. I guess maybe the first question I have is, uh, you mentioned how there were these um, lobbying efforts happening on both sides, and 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 I was reading a little bit about the Argentine one, and I was wondering, you know, if you knew much about, you know, how they were trying to convince Falklanders to to want to be Argentine. Yes, and they they did do a lot of great things in terms of trying to uh, expand access to health care and education on the island, um, providing its petrol, providing uh, its uh, uh, air service, providing its airlines. Mm -hmm. um, so they did. They did try to as sweeten you said, the deal, sweeten the deal. They did try to sweeten the deal because their their entire claim on the island was was premised on the language used in the U.N. resolution, which was that the interests of the Falklanders should be paramount. And Argentina was trying to show that, look, we take way better care of you than the British. The British, they're they're not, you know, taking care of your health care or anything. They're trying to cut you off and, you know, basically get rid of you. You know, they're not mm -hmm. even willing to have ships down here anymore. Mm -hmm. And we're willing to expend all this money to help you out. There was actually a, also a big Anglo-Argentine uh, community, um, second and third generation uh, Anglo-Argentinians Anglo who they would send to the island in, as kind of a public relations move to try and sell these uh, Britishers uh, on this idea that like, look, we, we come from the same people you do. We're part of the Argentinian uh, society. Things are great. You got nothing to worry about. So, yeah. So the second question following up on that, that's a good segue, I think, is you mentioned early on that the Falkland Islands were just uninhabited, right? It's just a bunch of rocks in the middle of the ocean, you know, yeah. that people happened upon one day when they were doing exploring. Yeah. 
And so nobody lived there initially. So what do you know what the ethnic makeup of the Falkland Islands was then and what that might look like in the later future when, you know, Britain and Argentina start fighting a war about it? What was like the ethnic ethnic makeup? Okay, so going back to like the 18th century? Uh, I, I guess maybe during the Falkland Islands War. Like during the Falkland point. Islands War, it was it was mm-hmm. principally it was principally Britishers. Okay. Yeah, overwhelmingly so. So like yeah. white Ang- Anglo's yeah. in that in that respect. They would lo- not look out of place. They spoke with the same accent. You mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, and then so that's kind of a little bit of an uphill battle, I guess, and and that's why you pointed out those those Anglo Argentinians who they sent over as emissaries to be like, hey, look, you know, we're the same. A um, little bit of an uphill battle on the Argentine side, wouldn't you say, uh, to convince them that, you know, they're, you know, they should join, right? Yeah, yeah. They did not have any success. That's interesting. All right, so let me make an observation about the article. So um, you make a point that um, I guess what the crux was is that Biden was – a close observer and a supporter of the Falklands War, which is kind of weird because it just shows you how ancient this guy is, <laughs> right? Like, it's just like a the whole then. other question that he was around in the 80s and he's like, I was a student of the uh, Falkland War. It's like, what? I was a student how, how of old the are ancient you again? Mesopotamian oh, Wars. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is so old. This guy is, is uh, it's been around. Because we have to remember his political career started very early. Like, what was he elected when he was just 30, 30, 31? Yeah, I think he was like a young guy 30s, when he was elected. Yeah, yeah and he was well, a Watergate baby. Yeah. Yep. So, like, I mean, man, his his uh, his uh roots go back deep. And so that's the first thing I thought of. But then, you know, you say the lesson learned is that Britain's strategic ambigu- ambiguity. So there was a level of you know, confusion of what they would actually do if, if uh, you know, Argentina invaded the island. And his policy towards Taiwan, the fact that just a couple of weeks ago, Biden said, you know, our commitment to Taiwan is rock solid, effectively breaking, you know, our strategic ambiguity that, you know, strategy that we've had for, you know, the past five decades or so, you know, the, the, the strategy of where we don't really say outright we're going to be defend Taiwan, but we're not going to tell China that we're not going to defend China, uh, Taiwan, just to keep everyone confused. So I guess um, you were saying that um, in order to prevent a war with China, Biden, this is what Biden thinks, in order to prevent a war with China, um, he thinks that he needs to be crystal clear about what the U.S. would do if they actually tried something militarily. Yes. Yeah. And there's actually interviews that you can go back and watch from 1982. He gave a lot of interviews because he was actually the author of the bill drafted and adopted the resolution adopted that said we are on the British side of this conflict. And he gives all his reasons for it. So he was he was a very active observer, active participant. And yeah, when you look at his reasoning that he laid out at the time. You can see that playing out now in the actions that he's taking in the uh, Indo-Pacific region. Now, here's the bigger now, here's the bigger thing. So when, last time we spoke, you know, you you talked about how, um, you know, it, this would almost be a project. Let's just say if, if China engaged in an invasion of Taiwan, they have um, a really large population of males um, that they don't really know what to do with. So potentially sending them into a meat grinder as opposed to maybe like a, you know, giant new deal type thing could be an option for China. However, um, I was listening to, or I was reading something from Lyle Goldstein, but you, do you read Lyle Goldstein? Goldstein? Uh, I haven't. No, he's a, he's a really interesting guy. So he, um, he writes a lot for the national interest, but he is a, uh, he's a professor at um, I think the U.S. Naval War College, and he writes a lot about China. He writes a lot about Taiwan, and he writes a lot about how um, the U.S. should not be committing to any type of defense pact with Taiwan because um, his reasoning is like the U.S. would lose a war. Like they would just lo- the United States would lose a war 
um, in a battle for Taiwan. And, you know, he he uses the compare, he uses the Falkland Islands as a comparison. But what he was saying was that for China, they actually um, would, they, they kind of, uh, it, it serves a purpose for an invasion of Taiwan because of their, um, they haven't been in a war for many years. And it's almost like a, um, a, um, a project, you know, they want to have martyrs. They want to have their world, you know, their war memorials to unify China. I was wondering what your take would be on that. Yes. And, you know, now that you say that, I actually I had read a couple of books from the from the Naval War College and there were a lot of essays in there. So I'm wondering if he was one of the the contributors, because that that is sounding very familiar. Um, no, I, I absolutely agree. I also think that, uh, yeah, definitely. A, it's very interesting observing China because it really is just it feels like a very pent up nation that's like swelling with pride, wanting to prove itself, show its mettle. And I mean, at the end of the day, who will bleed more for Taiwan? We lose, you know, a couple hundred guys and the U.S. public's going to just lose it. They're, they're going to want nothing more to do with the conflict. And, you know, China, I mean. Well, this is as, definitely as, something I, yeah, this is definitely well, something is, I want to talk about for, for sure. <laughs> well, yeah, for them, for them though, it, it's, I kind of see it as the end of the century of humiliation. So yeah. like this would be capstone, like we finally reunited China. Like that's the one province, the one renegade province that got away. So I understand how that's like a major project for their own nationalism. Um, but it's interesting. Like there is a, it's, it, it's, see, I'm on the side, I'm on the fence, man. I don't really have like a cohesive or consistent like view on what's going to happen with China and Taiwan. I'm more so just like, I, like every single article I read changes my mind. Like I'm very fair weather. Um, Danny, when we were talking about this, probably what, two months ago, you yep. were saying how you thought that Taiwan would be able to defend itself against China. Yeah, totally. And and I can regurgitate a little bit from that. I actually prepared for this. Um, and, and, and Joseph, you even pointed out when you listened to that episode that you thought, you know, I had a pretty good uh, read on the situation. For me, I still don't know if it would happen. But, you know, and, and I forget if it was Henry or, or Joseph who said this just a, a second ago, but whether or not the U.S. would win in a war, far be it for me to, you know, challenge the military expertise of the people who are writing in the, you know, Naval Military College articles. But, uh, yeah, there's some things, some facts that we know that I think, you know, maybe challenge this a little bit. Uh, and, and it really doesn't have anything to do with whether or not the U.S. would win or lose. It has everything to do with how would Taiwan hold up? Because, you know, we are talking about Taiwan here, right? They're not totally defenseless. So I want to review a few things that we talked about in, in our uh, episode on Taiwan. Uh, so I, I read an article by Tanner Greer. It was written in 2018 on, uh, in Foreign Policy. Uh, we'll try and link that up for our Patreon subscribers to take a look at. But um, it quotes Xi Jinping um, when he was speaking to the Ninth Party Congress about uh, the future of Taiwan in, in 2017. And, and it says, he goes to say, we have a firm will, full confidence and sufficient capability to defeat any form of Taiwan independent secession plot. We will never allow any person, any organization or any political party to split any part of the Chinese territory from China at, at any time or in any form. So unpacking this a little bit, you know, their stance is, is never going to happen. Taiwan is China's, you know, it's just a matter of time before we have everything, you know, all the ducks lined up in a row. You know, so every everything that I've read so far about China says that they will integrate Taiwan and that they're open to peacefully doing so, but only if it results in Taiwan becoming a part of China, right? Which, you know, to the point that we're talking about in the Falkland Islands, like, you know, this becomes a little bit difficult to talk about because Taiwan was inhabited and, you know, the Taiwanese people are kind of Chinese or at least as close to Chinese as you can get, right? They're basically the same people. Um, and, you know, but but there is a bit of a split. It is leaning heavily towards, uh, you know, being independent, but there are people who wish that they were a part of the Chinese Union. So, you know, this makes it more difficult than the conversation around whether or not the Falkland Islanders want to become Argentinian, right? So it, it you know, it's not going to be a peaceful transition if it happens. 
it'll be an invasion, right? So whether or not that invasion happens is you know up for debate, but the way that China is going to do this is pretty well documented, right? So their plans are as follows. So the PLA, the, the, the Chinese army, is going to use their rocket force, and they're going to launch rockets against Taiwan initially to just wreck infrastructure, right? And they'll do this well before any invasion. They're going to hit things like airfields, communication hubs, radar equipment, the like, right? They also plan on using sleeper agents in Taiwan or maybe some special forces. And there's the hammering. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear the that. Hammering. <laughs> the hammering. The hammering. The <laughs> hammering. Oh, I'm gonna bring out your bring out your bring out your inner Lawrence O'Donnell. <laughs> yeah, we've talked about him before. The hammering. All right, where was I? Um, so. Uh, they're going to use some sleeper agents in Taiwan and probably. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Henry, I have, I have this written down. Do you want to just read it um, for me for a second while they can, can commence their hammering? Well, all right. Let me bring up. You can let me, let me bring up something. So um, right. in Taiwan, the, from the polling I saw that most Taiwanese people, they they uh, see themselves as Taiwanese, they're not Chinese. I don't know, Joseph, have you ever seen anything like that? Like, what's your take on that? Like, as far as the um, people of Taiwan, like how how much influence do they want China to have? Or, or are they OK with that? Like, what's that look like? Well, there was an indigenous population and part of it was Han Chinese. But this goes back, you know, many, many centuries, you know, a millennia. Um, the first note uh, of Taiwan in any of the imperial records is back in like the 300 BCs. So, I mean, it, it but, the, but the only real, it wasn't until the, the uh, Qing dynasty that uh, in the, uh, let's see, the 17th century that they really started to interact um, with Taiwan. And you started seeing uh, more of the Han Chinese uh, starting to integrate into that population but it's it, taiwan's history as you say is, is very complicated but it is it is unquestionable that the majority of them do not want to um join the chinese union and i think after what happened with hong kong um where there had been an agreement that they were going to maintain uh the rights and privileges that they had negotiated and beijing unilaterally said yeah we're nope. done with that <laughs> and yeah. there was nothing and there was nothing that they could do. They were literally getting on rooftops with bow and arrows mm -hmm. to try and fight. That's I mean, that's well, beyond pointless. There's more no, yeah. more of a reason, more of a reason for the Chinese uh, for the Taiwanese to resist. And I guess now we, I, I think the hammering for now has subsided. So back to the Chinese invasion plans, because they'd have to invade. Right. They're not going to peacefully take over because they know what happened to Hong Kong, as you pointed out, Joe. So uh, they're going to use rockets blow up a bunch of shit. The one that I got stuck on is sleeper agents. So they're going to use sleeper agents to blow up things internally, or maybe land a couple of special forces to like blow shit up like behind enemy lines. Uh, and they want to do this so that they can soften, you know, Chinese defenses, but also so that they can hit the morale of the ta Taiwanese people, right? They're like, Hey, look, we just blew up a bunch of shit. Like you don't want to fight us. Right. And then they will commence history's largest and uh, amphibious assault. It's going to involve tens of thousands of Chinese ships, and many of them, honestly, are going to be merchant ships that they just commandeer. Uh, and they're going to ferry a million soldiers over because they're going to need a shit ton of people to occupy that island, right? And she says that they can get it done in two weeks, tops. So that's their plan, right? Now, I pointed this out in the last episode, and I'll, and I'll be as abridged as possible. If you want more information, you can listen to that episode, but... Uh, it's not going to be that easy, right? It's, it, the way that she makes it sounds, it's like a cakewalk, but I think part of that is just him, you know, ramping up, you know, it, domestic support for an invasion, right? Oh, it's going to be easy. Just like, you know, we're going to have a two week, you know, stint in Afghanistan and that's going to be it, right? Uh huh. So that, that, that <laughs> didn't pan out that way. So on paper, what we know is Taiwan is an island. Like, duh, right? Um, now I say I say this not to be facetious, but because weather plays a huge part in this, in, in any of these operations. So, you know, one thing that experts know is that Taiwan is, is, you know, there is only a limited period of time in a year where a major military operation could take place, crossing crossing that that hundred mile, you know, water. 
So in April and October, they, those happen to be the only two months out of the entire year where there aren't any storms uh, in, in that region, right? So either they go now or we're going to have to wait until next April, right? Um, and uh, for obvious reasons, I mean, the Mongols tried to invade Japan and got crushed by tsunamis just in, in, inadvertently, you know, and typhoons and shit. So, you know, they're not going to be dumb. They're going to wait until it's good to go, right? Uh, and then another thing is that there's only 13 beaches on Taiwan's western coast that, you know, the Chinese could possibly land at. Everybody knows those places, right? So you can imagine they, they're prepared. They know where they're going to land, right? Or at least one of 13 places or a couple of 13 places, right? Uh, the Taiwanese are definitely going to see an invasion coming literally 100 miles away because <laughs> they're 100 miles away. Um so I got this quote from from that article, and I'll just read it really quickly. So um, they say, uh, Taiwanese, American, and Japanese leaders will know that the PLA is preparing for a cross-strait war more than 60 days before the hostilities begin. They will know for certain that an invasion will happen more than 30 days before the missiles are fired. This will give Taiwanese ample time to move much of their command and control infrastructure and hardened mountain tunnels, move their fleet out of vulnerable ports, detain suspected agents and intelligence operatives, Litter the ocean with sea mines and blah, 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 right? Like they're, they, they'll have time to prepare. And the reason why they'll know this is because literally satellites, right? You don't move a million men from China to Taiwan without something happening that you can see with a satellite, right? There's just way too many people, right? Way too many things moving around. They're going to know. They're just going to know. Taiwan intends to totally adopt a guerrilla style defense in the event of an invasion, um, so kind of like how the Taliban did in Afghanistan or or any of the insurgencies in Iraq uh, and and um, you know nearby places. So, but but the difference between the Middle East and and Afghanistan and their guerrilla style and Taiwan's will be that Taiwan is like a you know first world nation that is extremely well equipped, better trained, you know, and they're going to have a heads up that it's coming, right? So they're going to dig in. Taiwan has rockets too. They're also going to use them. They're going to use them to hit the the places where the the um, uh, the Chinese will embark to go to Taiwan. They're going to use them to hit radar stations. They're going to use them to hit just you know ships that are in the water coming over. Right? They're going to use their rockets as well. You know, that's nothing nothing special. Um, and then Taiwan also wants to use mines. I think I mentioned that before. Which is kind of controversial, right? Because uh, they're kind of hard to decommission after you put them out there. Um, but they fully intend to use them. Um, and this one's the most interesting one that I found out. Uh, I don't know, Joseph, are you a Game of Thrones fan? Oh yeah. Okay, so they intend to light the ocean on fire on their coastlines, <laughs> like you know the Battle of Blackwater Bay, uh, where uh, Tyrion puts a bunch of, um, what do they call it, wildfire into the water and they shoot, Bronn shoots that like flaming arrow into it, right? They're going to do the same thing, okay? They're literally going to pump, they have these tunnels and these pipelines set up already to pump millions of gallons of oil into all of these 13 landing spots and just set it on fire, right? So like good luck landing on it because it's on fire now and they're fully willing to like destroy the ecosystem to do so, right? Um I think that was like the most interesting one. Also, this one was cool. They're going to set up dummy targets to basically waste the Chinese time. There's another interesting quote. In the 1990 to 91 Gulf War, 85,000, excuse me, 88,000 tons of ordnance dropped by the US coalition did not destroy a single Iraqi road missile defense launcher. NATO's 78-day cam campaign aimed at the Serbian air defenses only managed to destroy 3 of Serbia's 22 mobile missile batteries. There is no reason to think that the Chinese Air Force will have a higher success rate when targeting Taiwan's mobile artillery and missile defense. So, like, they're just going to fuck around and make, like, you know, a bunch of blow up missile launchers to, like, you know, throw people off. It's going to be hilarious. Um, and, and of course, Taiwan thinks that they can hold the Chinese for at least two weeks, which to, you know, to their credit, the Chinese know that if it lasts more than two weeks, they're not going to last. It'll just be too logistically of a nightmare. So that's that's all I have to say on this particular issue. I I so if we bring in the U.S. on top of this, you know, would the U.S. win this war? You know, I don't even think they need to be involved necessarily. I think it, the Taiwanese are going to make it a pain in the ass for the Chinese. And if we happen to get involved as well, well, we might muck it up. But you know, the likelihood is that we can probably support them 
And uh, this was confirmed recently that we've had troops in Taiwan, quite a few of them, as well as other uh, you know weapons in Taiwan for at least the last year. So we're already there. We don't have to wait to go there, you know. So I don't know. I have I'm skeptical. What do you think, Joseph? Well, let's let's pick up at the end of your your hypothetical here, because before I before I launch into the can I was jotting notes. I don't know if you could hear me scribbling over here. <laughs> Furiously but, scribbling notes, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So, all right. This is end of week two. There's petrol fires just raging. The entire place <laughs> is covered in black smoke. Right. Infrastructure is just blown to hell. Everyone is sheltering. Right. Uh, the government is underground. Then what? Well, you know, you, well, I presume that you continue that. I, I know that they're going to be arming a lot of their reservists. So they have two and a half million uh, army reservists and they're going to be stationing them in city centers and doing a guerrilla style warfare. So they just wait for the siege and see if, if China is still willing to, after that two week period, continue. And if they are, you know, at least this this is all propaganda from the Taiwanese government here. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. But apparently they are willing to do some crazy shit to hold their land. Right. And this is totally independently of any exterior or outside forces. Right. And, you know, China does hold a seat on the, uh, you know, arms committee, a permanent seat. Right. In the U.N. And uh, they can probably veto that. But like in, you know, course of public opinion they're gonna they're i mean the world is gonna see pictures and videos of just taiwan on fire right i wonder how much that pressure would influence china's decision to keep going and if that influence doesn't uh, affect them to keep going would their losses because they're going to suffer major casualties trying would that uh, change their opinion to keep going and if it's not the public opinion and if it's not the losses logistically are they able to keep up and continue to supply this major force of a million men to continue pressing and laying siege to Taiwan? And those are all really hard questions to answer, but like it's also kind of stacked against the Chinese in that respect. Okay, I, well, I will just say, once they start, they're not gonna be able to stop because that would be the end of the regime's legitimacy. Right. I and mean, Xi Jinping That's has right. staked everything on this. So if they mm -hmm. go for it, which it, it is a, a tough nut to crack, which is why I think they have made no attempt to do so, mm -hmm. because it's not a cakewalk. And if nope. you win, it's glorious. It's glorious. Your legacy is cemented. You're, you know, the father of your nation. If you lose, this is the end for you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it really is all or nothing here. So it's, it's not a cakewalk. Um, a couple of things that, that I had jotted down here. Um, was the importance of area denial. This, I think, mm -hmm. is the reason that the Argentinians lost the Falklands War. Because really, it was, an, it was a close-run thing. Um, it was not a cakewalk for the British. They were not used to projecting force. Um, their navy was so depleted, they had to round up. Almost half their fleet was composed of merchant ships. So mm -hmm. this was not the British navy at its peak. Right. But basically... The, Argent the Argentinians allowed themselves to be pushed out of the of the region. So what their idea was, we'll just prevent the British from landing troops on the island. Mm -hmm. But in the skirmishes that happened, the Argentinian Navy was pushed out and the British basically choked the island off. Mm -hmm. And then they were just able to go in and deal with the soldiers, the Argentinians who were still there. Right. So my, my thought on this is, it's it's likely that and, and in fact this was one of the the major articles from the the book from the uh, strategic studies institute was the importance of area denial, um, and this is why the AUKUS deal with the nuclear submarines was such a big deal. Mm -hmm. People didn't really understand like diesel electric submarines, nuclear submarines. What's the difference? Well, the difference is range and longevity. Right. Mm -hmm. And the Australians are really one of the countries on the front line. They were the first ones to really stand up to the Chinese. Uh, and they're ready to to take it to them. Uh, I was telling Henry, I was just watching like their version of 60 Minutes, uh, an episode from last month. And I mean, it's just like fear level 100 about China uh, in, in Australia, in their government. And so the, the nuclear submarines would allow them to go poke around in China's backyard for an extended period of time, helping to undermine any campaign at area denial. Because mm -hmm. in my view, 
what you would want to do is close off any ability for any outside force to help Taiwan. Right. Because Taiwan is heavily trade dependent. Like mm -hmm. they're they're literally just going to run out of things to sustain themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, theoretically, the Chinese could. The the CCP could win the war without even firing a shot. Maybe. I mean, if you could if you could effectively cordon off the island, which is only 80 miles away. Right. Um, Japan's Navy is still in the in the incipient process of, of being built back up. Australia, you know, they're going to be having nuclear submarines here in, in a few years. But I, I do think the land campaign on Taiwan would be just as brutal as you're describing. And it's far from certain that the, the Chinese would win. And so I think the best strategy starts with area denial. Another thing that I jotted down was the importance of satellites and cyber war. Mm. This is something that doesn't get talked about a lot because cyber warfare is still something relatively new. Right. But actually, just recently, the Pentagon's top cyber war guy quit quit because he said that they're they're just not serious enough about cyber war and he said that the chinese are years ahead of us years ahead mm -hmm. of us and so all of these you know weapon systems and stuff like what if they get hacked with some malware what if it comes time to deploy these defenses and they just don't work what if talking about satellite imagery we know that the russians have been working on space to space fighting capabilities Sure. Like they've been launching projectiles from satellites for years. Yeah, causing and a lot of trouble up there too. I'm just saying, like they could mm -hmm. very easily fire a projectile and take out U.S. satellites. I mean, what would the U.S. go to war if the Chinese knocked out a couple of their satellites? They might. They might, but I mean, to what end? Like, what, are you going to get Beijing to pay you back for the satellites? Are you going <laughs> to? land troops on mainland china i just don't see protecting taiwan like okay i, th I feel like that's that's not my preference but i, I can at least see the rationale for that mm -hmm. and how it might work i just don't see what a war between the united states and china would like even direct, look like huh? what would it accomplish what would what would be the strategic aim mm -hmm. um so I, I could or just again using malware using using cyber warfare to you know hack the satellites take them offline it doesn't even need to be physical damage you know joe biden i think there's a reason that one of the first things he said when he came to office was that just because it's a cyber war attack doesn't mean we won't take it as an act of war right mm -hmm. so right. he's trying to set very clear lines but it's hard to know if the u.s public would get on board with something like that mm -hmm. like oh, they hacked one of our satellites so you need to go to war with them Mm -hmm. over taiwan where is that again what is that right. is that the falcon Islands? i think most people <laughs> yeah. don't can't it's, so i, I do think can't. taiwan stands a good chance on its own mm -hmm. but i definitely think the ccp has been investing for example their miss their their uh hypersonic ballistic missile capability yeah they just did a launch top. recently actually and it and it was pretty shocking how well it went yeah 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 the, the defense establishment said they were shocked yep. so take that for what it's worth but one thing that struck me as interesting in comparing the, the hypothetical conflict over Taiwan and the Falklands War was just how wildly inaccurate Argentinian missile batteries were. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they were literally just missing. I mean, they still blew up. Uh, I can't remember, like a dozen British ships. Uh, it wasn't it took enough. Them like hundreds of shots. Yeah, to get exactly. It, right? I mean, we're, we're going to be talking about missiles that, I mean, A, if it hits your ship, there's just no question what's going to happen to the ship. And these are going to be satellite guided. They're going to be mm -hmm. maneuverable in flight. Um, they could mm -hmm. be coming from space. I mean, right. It's it's definitely a whole different ball game in terms of the missile technology that's available today. And so, in terms of cyber warfare, hypersonic ballistic missile missile capability, proximity. Um, I definitely think it would. And and just in terms of their ability to close off access to Taiwan in terms of an area denial campaign. Mm -hmm. I think they'll be able to do that much more effectively than the Argentinians were, because this is important. The Argentinians, and I point this out in the article, um, Argentina's junta said later, they did it because they thought the British weren't going to fight back. <laughs> they also thought that the Americans would support them mm -hmm. because, of course, Henry Kissinger, when he was uh, he was secretary of state by that point, had encouraged the junta to take charge of the situation because he was mm -hmm. worried that Isabel Perón was losing control of the country to leftists. And hmm. so they thought, oh, we're part of the Organization of American States. We're on the front line of the Cold War. The Americans will have our backs. No, 
they said those two assumptions right there, if we had known either of those two things, we never would have tried it. Never would have tried it. They, they were not really that prepared for it. And still, it was a difficult campaign for the British. So, Well, and, and that, that remains the only link between the Falkland Islands and this Taiwan thing is that um, ambiguity, the strategic ambiguity about whether or not we would intervene. Um, Henry, it's not like well, you the other link. The, the other link is that is that China is clearly studying the Falkland War. Like mm -hmm. China has been a student for a lot of wars over the past 100 years. Like, you know, I've read stuff about how China studies uh, the Omaha, like like D Day, like the beach landings in D Day. Um, how they have studied th their failures in the Korean uh, in the Korean War. How logistically they basically in the Korean War, the the Chinese had the UN forces on the run, but then they ran out legit like they ran past their logistic support. So I mean that is like the other link with the Falkland Wars that they mm -hmm. they look at that war as a as a textbook of what um what it would be like and um you know apparently or what from what I've read they they uh, admire the British logistical endeavor. Yeah, no, totally. And and I think logistics is that final point that I was making about whether or not they'd be able to last if they went full out invasion. You know, more uh, most experts believe that more than two weeks and you know, you're going to you're going to tap that well dry uh, logistically to, to keep keep up that fight. But I do want to respond, uh, uh, Joseph, to a few of those things that you said. So especially area denial. I just wrote this down, so I was furiously scribbling too. Um, so you said, uh, and you mentioned this in almost in passing. You were like, hey, "I'll I'll scribble you. <laughs> I shall <laughs> scribble, scribble back. me. <laughs> this is so a you... duel of scribbles." <laughs> oh man! All right, so so you said, "Hey, That's what I've been drawing?" Oh Jesus, Henry! What drawing. have you been drawing? <laughs> I wrote Henry Zamota, my signature. China plus Taiwan, Taiwan, uh, a sun, and then um, that is about it. <laughs> I mean, I, I would have just started drawing penises. That's usually <laughs> what I drew. Like, I'll just. Well, make sure to show uh, the camera after on. this if, if you get a good one. Um, all right. So, Ari Denial, you, you mentioned almost in passing, you said that. Uh, at the time, the British, it wasn't like the, the height of the British, you know, uh, Navy, right? And that they had to borrow upon merch, a lot of merchant ships to get this done. And, you know, actually, uh, from articles that I read about this, you know, invasion of Taiwan, China doesn't have enough surface vessels to move people over. As a matter of fact, they don't, they just don't have enough surface vessels in general, right? Like their, their Navy is kind of weak right oh, yeah. definitely strong definitely stronger than taiwan's right uh, maybe can go toe-to-toe -to -toe to with japan's because they've been you know artificially curtailed on what they can and can't build but um you know it their navy sucks so they're gonna have to use merchant vessels as well which are gonna be ill-equipped to do a lot and i wonder if that kind of puts a hole in the area denial strategy as well right can they feasibly hold you know an area with merchant ships against, you know, a Japanese cruiser, right? Or against, a, you know, a U.S. strike group, right? Or against, definitely not against, uh, you know, some nuclear submarines by the the uh, Aussies there, right? So I wonder if, while I agree that that should be the strategy, I just don't know if they have the the means to to do that, right? What they have the means for, at least in theory, is a land invasion, right? Or an amphibious assault, right? They could do that, and they have enough people, and they could muster up enough, you know, ships that could just move people across from one another. But as far as like naval warfare goes, I don't know. I, I just don't know that they have that capability. I could be wrong, right? I could be totally wrong. I, I actually agree with your point in terms of in terms of actual ships that they could put in the water that are battle ready. Mm -hmm. When I when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about it in terms of flying sorties. OK. And basically letting everyone know, like these these hypersonic ballistic missile batteries, they're not just for show. If you cross right. this line, this is just, and it would just take one demonstration. Right. Um, I don't. Mm -hmm. And that's that's where for me, would would they fire first on, on a U.S. strike group? Like if they if they said, hey, well, 
we we hear what you're doing about the area denial, but we're going to sail through the Taiwan Strait to show that you don't have the right to do this. Like, would they actually fire on a U.S. ship? I don't would know. They, that's a really good them? question. You know, that's I don't a know. very I mean, good question. Would, I, I mean, then I think all bets are off. I mean. Yeah. And, and then there goes your, your you know, uh, uh, what's the uh, uh, casus? Um, casus belli. Causes belli. There we go. That's the reason for the U.S. to get involved in a direct confrontation if someone if they shot a, a cruise missile at one of our you know carriers or something like that. But again, even on the fighter jets bit. So I know a bit about this as well. And funny enough, Taiwanese, at least as of 2017, excuse me, 2018, their you know uh, their current uh, makeup of fighters that they could use for these sorties, they have about 400 of them whereas the Taiwanese had 420. So actually the Taiwanese has a better air force, at least as of 2018, than the Chinese do. So only flying sorties alone might not work either because the Taiwanese can actually defend themselves in the air, right? If it's just straight up air, they can actually defend themselves. So in, you know, for this area denial, I agree, you know, they probably just can't do ships, right? They'll probably use them for sure. And you know, they'll probably stay far enough away from Taiwan so as not to provoke them to attack them, but close enough to warn others from coming closer. And then they'll have to fly those sorties. But the Taiwanese can fly their own sorties, right? They can also deploy many, many uh, aircraft in the air, uh, more as of 2018, allegedly, right? Um, so there's that. I know the Chinese have been working really hard on on upping their game in in, in the air field. I know that they, they they've got a knockoff uh, F-35 or something like that that they're working on. That maybe they have a lot of. Who knows? I don't know. Chinese are weird. They don't really tell. If we us. want to win a war against China, then let them have a knockoff F-35. <laughs> yeah, let them do it. They um, have knockoff Sukhois as well. The yeah. Russians thought they were going to buy a bunch of them, and no, they just took the floor model and like took it apart, and we're like, okay. So we can basically make something like this, right? Sure. Yeah. Chinese and have, have them make a bunch of planes that the helmet tears their head off. Right. That, that's a good yeah. way. Win a war. Maybe the F-35s directly. <laughs> I was saying maybe. maybe yeah, the that's planes. how we win. We just sell them F-35s. <laughs> we'll bankrupt them and kill all their pilots. Well, I was just going to say maybe the F-35 program is just the most expensive counter op like counterintelligence operation <laughs> where we intentionally created the shittiest airplane for the chinese to copy so that they can fail ultimately <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's what we're doing here that'd right? be some that'd be some next level strategy that's uh what you call <laughs> that's what the, that's what you call 4d chest yep yeah i don't I think have, there's I have a legitimate question chest. i have a legitimate question and i yeah. think probably both of you could answer this um but so what is the difference between a hypersonic missile and a supersonic missile? Like, what is the difference in speed? Because I, there's been a race over the past, what, I, I don't know how long this race has been to get a hypersonic missile, but, um, like, what what is the uh, difference in how fast that missed that yeah, warhead? Yeah, it's, it's will definitely get a, a, a difference of speed. So uh, supersonic just means above the speed of sound, right? And so that's Mach 1. Any, any... Any uh, flying object that can go faster than the speed of sound, even by a little bit, is uh, supersonic. Hypersonic, on the other hand, is fucking fast, right? There's there's some... That's the difference of fucking? Yeah. It's, <laughs> well, I have the exact number. It's, it's Mach 5. It's 3,836.35 miles per hour, which is, I don't I don't even know how many... I don't even know how many like feet per second that is. It's ridiculously fast. Um, Mach 5 is very, 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 very fast. It's five times the speed of sound. There's a little bit of debate about like what could, can, you know, what really does hypersonic mean? Some people have the bar a little bit higher at 6,000 miles per hour. But I think the, the, wind, the minimum entry window uh, is almost 4,000 miles an hour. It's fast, much, it's a, much faster. It's amazing how well human beings are able to create things that just kill people really good <laughs> yeah. isn't it yeah. yeah it's just amazing how we yeah. were able to advance technology and killing more than probably anything else ever like we just advanced our killing game by so much since since the start of civilization like do you think cavemen 
or like the first uh the first like warlords were thinking man one day we're going to have uh something called a ballistic missile that shoots up into space and then it's going to land you know through gravity it's going to land in a precise area at a speed where they won't know what happened until it wipes out their entire civilization it, oh, yeah you would not even have time to consciously process that <laughs> no, it no, literally no. moves too fast i mean yeah it's crazy i i'm i'm always blown away by the fact that we have no more ma- access to material resources today than did the early humans you know fifty thousand years ago we just have knowledge yeah, we just got with the application of knowledge with the application of knowledge we've been able to synthesize you know skyscrapers hypersonic ballistic missiles we can grow organs and meat in petri <laughs> yeah. dishes and like yep. it's just it's amazing it really yep. is amazing yeah and it's funny you know to, to henry's point you know our, our most advanced our biggest advances have been in the art of killing people and then some of our other m- biggest achievements are just offshoots of our endeavor to kill people like going to space is just an offshoot of ballistic missiles you know and like satellites is just an you know like gps and uber is just an offshoot of trying to kill people right the internet um, the GPS, internet is just an yeah. offshoot of trying to kill people which actually is a yep uh, yeah. that that's actually a really good um transition because there was another thing you said that i wanted to talk about which is the cyber warfare part right didn't want to leave that out there without a response so i actually really agree with you on this front i think that's probably the the most the easiest well maybe not easy i don't want to say it that way i think it's probably the clearest way to mess with us uh, or to mess with Taiwan is to go cyber, right? Can they penetrate Taiwan's uh, infrastructure? Um, How much of Taiwan's defense systems, you know, can be penetrated through the internet without even going anywhere, right? And how well can the Chinese mask the fact that they're doing that, right? Um, obviously everyone's going to know it's China, right? But with the internet and, you know, how it works and hacking is that there at least is a plausible deniability, you know, uh, unless you're really bad at covering your tracks. Um, so that could be one way. I don't know if they could just spoof satellite imagery because they'd have to spoof satellite imagery from everyone all over the world, including governments and private companies, you know, like Elon Musk could see what's going on right now if he wanted to, you know, um, so that that would be an uphill battle to to like make pretend that nothing's happening, um, but that doesn't preclude them from shooting at space stuff, shooting at satellites, you know. But I wonder if there's a bit of a mutually assured destruction for you know downing satellites as there is with like using nuclear weapons, right? Because you you down one of our satellites, we're gonna down one of your satellites if if that. Like at a minimum. I want you to point to the sky. Which satellite do you care about the least? <laughs> right. All right. Knock that satellite down. Exactly. You know, so that, that would that would cause what, in my opinion, would be utterly catastrophic for human civilization, which is, you know, the the junking of copious amounts of uh, satellites, which would cause s- so much space junk, which is already a problem, uh, and it could render you know, using near Earth, near Earth orbit, like impossible. You know, you ever see uh, Gravity with the uh, Sandra yeah. Bullock? Yes. Immediately, what I thought of is is uh, the space Think junk in that. Those that scenes. that is is uh, a silly movie, but it is somewhat accurate in that respect. You blow up one, that can cause a chain reaction that just destroys so much other shit. And it's really hard, if not impossible, to fix. Guys, keep on going. I'm going to run to the bathroom real quick. At this, sure. at this point, sure. Um, I don't know that, again, when uh, obviously I'm not a high-level dictator. <laughs> so I, don't, I can't speak from personal experience, but I know that just from looking at political incentive structures, which is how I tend to view most, most decision-making. That's fair. Is that space junk... Is is that more important than keeping power? Does you keeping power mean you have to take Taiwan? Well, if it does, and creating some space junk is part and parcel of taking Taiwan, then you make space junk. 
It's a problem. It's a new problem. But your position is still secure. And I see no reason to think that the Chinese leadership are like some kind of super altruistic people who are really concerned that, you know, oh, well, I'll cause all kinds of problems and suffering for humanity if I, if we potentially do this. Um, yeah, I mean, and, maybe they're yeah, maybe not thinking about humans in general, but it certainly would affect them. I mean, they've got satellites up there, and there's no telling. You, know, you you blow up a U.S. satellite, and then it causes a you know a chain reaction that you know gives a gravity style you know <laughs> thing that just starts wiping out all of your satellites, and that now you're fucked, yeah. right? You're shooting and that's, yourself. That's why I think that's why I think the cyber warfare capabilities are, are going to be so important in the quantum. I, I agree. Game. I agree. Because really, it's there. It's hard to say. Uh, you know your satellite, you know, starts malfunctioning. Like how quickly are you going to be able to figure out what's going on and who did it? Right. And, mm -hmm. and what to do about it. And what to matter. do about it, you mm -hmm. know? And again, it's as long as there's plausible deniability. I mean, we, we've already seen this back and forth with, I mean, this is obviously such a trivial example by comparison, but, or maybe you don't think it's trivial. I, I kind of thought it was trivial, but uh, the, you know, the Russian election interference, mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. trying to prove that you know the research uh what is it the russian research division internet research division was doing yeah. it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it was back and forth for like a year right i mean mm -hmm. if, if the chinese really only need to buy themselves a couple weeks maybe that's um, enough time. yeah mm -hmm. so yeah no i i fully agree with you i think you know i hope the chinese aren't listening and trying to get some tips but that you know <laughs> If I was advising the Chinese, I think that that would be the route, you know. Danny I mean, and Joe said this is the way to go. <laughs> so I want to hear I want to hear um, perspectives on what do you think the appetite is in the American population for war? I don't think it's very high. I think there's a lot of posturing going on. I think especially right now in the conservative movement in the right wing movement, they really. Um, Something that defines like kind of the modern right wing movement as we, as we see it right now is like we need some type of an external threat that we can rally behind and kind of uh, be uh, like America against. And China is definitely taking that mantle, man. Like you watch Tucker Carlson and Tucker Carlson, is someone who I praise a lot on this show. He's someone who I criticize a lot on the show. I like he's an interesting show. But man, everything falls to China. Like, oh, it's China, 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 China. Um, I was speaking to one of my friends the other day. My friend's like, can you believe, she's like, she's like can you believe that uh, China, uh, that the U.S. is just going to leave Taiwan out to dry? And I was like, who cares? It doesn't affect me. He's like, yeah, but like it's Taiwan. I'm like, do you really care about Taiwan? He's like, no, not really. I don't really care that much. And he admitted that. But it was more of just kind of an anti-China thing. Um, do you think that the American populace, if we went to war with China, do you think that they would ever, do you think they would just be like, hold on, wait, wait a second, wait a second, we're not going to like actually sacrifice soldiers or even worse, like put one of our cities up for grabs in a potential nuclear war. What do you guys think? I, I definitely think, think you're right in terms of there's rhetoric, there's posturing. I also think that part of the American right wing is they don't want to be the world policeman. That was always more of a liberal internationalist dream. Mm -hmm. And there that that was incorporated into part of the Cold War. And initially, the Republicans who were very resistant to liberal internationalism started using it as a club to go after uh, Harry Truman. And then it just kind of got wrapped into the platform. So that that kind of transformed. And then Eisenhower won uh, over uh, Taft. So you, you had the Eastern establishment Republican wing taking control of the party. And then you had the Goldwater types, uh, the Buchanan types that were always kind of pushed off to the side of the stage. But that isolationist that the, the, the America needs to come home, take care of itself. Don't worry about what the rest of the world is doing. Um, that movement was always there. And, and Trump was able to, I think, uh, ride that frustration, that anger over really uh, the George W. Bush policies, um, the tremendous pile of failures that were his foreign engagements. And so on the one hand, I do think, you know, who is it? Madison Cawthorn the other day was at a Turning Point USA rally, and he, he said that we should start confiscating all U.S. or all Chinese assets that we can. So on the one hand, there's this, we don't want to be the world's policeman. We don't want to foot the bill for everyone else's security. But at the same time, 
you know, China's terrible and, you know, we need to stand up for Taiwan. But I always ask people, like, would you be OK with your son or daughter going to fight for Taiwan? Would you be OK if they got killed fighting for Taiwan? And the answer is invariably no. No, I wouldn't be OK with that. Well, it's like, well, someone's going to have to die for it. And at, from my perspective, putting the credibility, of, I'm not I'm not hawkish. I'm not an internationalist and in a military internationalist. If I were, though, I would not want to get directly involved in this conflict, because if you lose, this would totally undermine U.S. security. It would undermine the credibility of U.S. security guarantees in the Indo-Pacific. So if you go and if you get involved and then you lose. I mean, for me, that that would be devastating to your credibility. Well, this is what this is what the Hawks say. The Hawks say that the fact that we're not making a like an actual formal defense pact with with Taiwan, because what Joe Biden said, it was just like it was just verbal, like it's a rock solid commitment. But there's no defense treaty sign like there's no mm -hmm. like if Taiwan is invaded by China, then, you know, there's going to be aircraft carriers on their way the moment that happens. Um, their justification is that the fact that we don't for, like, you know, for this behavior for potentially defending Taiwan is that if we don't do it, then it destroys U.S. credibility with our with our partners in the Pacific, that it will destroy our relationship with Japan it will destroy our relationship with Korea. It will destroy our relationship with Korea, with uh, with the Philippines. And that's what that's the justification they use for us having some type of national interest in it. I think that we're when when these, uh, you know, think tankers start using that word or when they start saying that phrase like, hey, we need to defend American credibility. I think it's a little horseshit. I think they just want to, you know, more or less preserve the credibility of their job at their think tank and they want stuff to write about. So that's why they're saying all this stuff. But what do you think about that? Like, do you think that um, if we does, it, does that destroy American credibility? The fact that we don't have a defense pact, the fact that we're not willing to go say, hey, Taiwan, like it's on paper. If China, like, consider yourself a colony of the United States. That's what you are. We're going to treat you like that. We're going to we're going to treat you like the 51st, the 51st state. OK, 52nd. Puerto Rico is the 51st. <laughs> All right. 52nd state. You got to get Puerto Rico in there. <laughs> You'll be 50, 52nd state. You'll be our our police, our watchmen in the, in the east. Well, um, I mean. Going all the way back to uh, the 40s. Uh, there was the Cairo conference, which established the principle that the Japanese need to give back all the territory that they took from China, mm -hmm. including Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Then you have numerous administrations adhering to the policy of one China. And then with Nixon throwing over the Republic of China for the People's Republic of China, and then abrogating, eliminating the defense pact that we did have with Taiwan. I just think there's no question at all. I think it was Henry, you mentioned, or, or maybe it was Danny, mentioned that China has a seat on the UN Security Council. Right. Like they can mm -hmm. just veto anything like that, that they didn't like. And the UN doesn't recognize Taiwan as a separate entity. But one thing that, that strikes me as interesting with your point there about institutions and think tanks and the talking points they spout, Something that's really interesting, and I noticed this going back and doing like an archaeology of the run up to the Iraq war, the second the second Iraq war um, in the 1990s was how a lot of the like Lakutist talking points started appearing coming out of American think tanks. And if you trace the money, it was coming from Israel. And if you look at like the Project 2049 Institute, the Geffart Group, uh, the Taiwan Caucus, like they spend millions of dollars starting about uh, probably about 20 years ago, they started dumping money into lobbying and funding institutes and think tanks. And the really the rhetoric has started to sound exactly like the the progressive party in Taiwan. Uh, their talking points mm. that, that this is about American credibility and, you know, it's a vital national security interest. And so so for me, I, I do think that there is an institutional structure where you need to say certain things if you want to keep that job. Um, at the same time, uh, the Japanese PM, I know I know he's gone now and they just had an election, but he basically said, look, we're not worried. We're vital. We really are vital. 
Japan is vital. We've got massive U.S. military bases. We have a very long relationship. We have an official on paper relationship. Um, the Koreans, the Australians, the Philippines. So I don't know that realistically any of them would lose a lot of sleep if they woke up one morning and the Chinese were setting up a blockade of Taiwan. Like, does this mean the U.S. wouldn't protect us? First of all, that's that's totally different from a U.N. perspective. Like, Taiwan is part of China. Japan is not part of China. Korea, not part of China. So they're not, like, violating inter any internationally recognized boundaries by invading Taiwan. Um, it's it's really, there as uh, I think, Danny, you, you pointed out the optics of it. You know, mm -hmm. the world sees Taiwan on fire. That's why I, I mentioned this in the last episode. And you brought up the idea of like a lot of aerial sorties going on between like pretty equally matched, you know, forces. Like what if the Taiwanese fired first, mm -hmm. you know, or, or the or the Chinese like mocked up, you know, some kind of false flag that they had been hit first. Right. Like then the optics totally changed. Like now, right. you know, this renegade province that, you know. It was always understood that it was going to come back to China eventually, that it never really left, that there was some kind of odd ambiguity going on here. I just don't know how much the rest of the world is really going to care because there, China is so much more important to the international trading community than, than the United States is. Far more countries do way more trade with China than the United States, almost almost twice as many. So yeah. at the end of the day, I again, I look at like... Uh, Russia. Russia goes in and takes, you know, the Donbass and the Crimea and stuff. And at the end of the day, there was only so far the Europeans were really willing to go. And none of the Central Asian states cared. China didn't care. And so I just I wonder how much, even if the optics did start to look bad, like what what is anyone really willing to put on the line domestically for this issue? I mean, there there is some technology coming out of um, uh, manufacturing coming out of uh, Taiwan that would be um, detrimental to American corporate interests. And as we know that, you know, the the I think we said this in in the Patreon Slack at one point that uh, the U.S. is is kind of like a mercenary to U.S. corporate interests, right? So forget about the public opinion for a moment. You know, if Apple doesn't see that silicon coming out of Taiwan, you know which is a major distributor of, of said materials, and they're not able to pivot that manufacturing out to, I don't know, Vietnam or some other places, which they're actually actively doing because I think they understand what's going on there, you know, and that disrupts, you know, sales of Apple and, you know, Google and God knows what other companies that require this silicon, they might call upon the, the U.S. corporate mercenary to do something about it, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a totally valid point, but they've also been dumping money into domestic semiconductor manufacturing. For sure. So, but I mean, they just a have minute. a big bill over the summer subsidizing to, that. To replicate that, you know, to, to totally- well, And, and uh, TSMC is opening a facility here in the United States. That's right, that's so right. So, it's not like the technology, you know, wouldn't be accessible. There might be a supply chain interruption and, you know, maybe you can't get your new iPhone, but like Apple wants the government to go fight Taiwan. Like someone's going to need to go fight. Do you want to go fight for Taiwan? I, I don't. don't. I don't either. But we're talking I about don't. corporate interests versus like human interests. Right. And and sometimes, as we can see with the many wars that we fought over, you know, the last, say, 20, 30 years here, sometimes the corporate interests went out over, you know, actual true American interests. And, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't want to underwrite that at all. I also don't want to overinflate it either. I, I understand where we're coming from. We could get semiconductors elsewhere. But no, the no, Noam Chomsky's uh, in, uh, manufacturing of consent should mm -hmm. be required reading, I think, in, in primary school. Of course, it's public school, so they don't want people reading that. <laughs> um, yeah. But Henry pointed it out. Um, yes, you just bombard people with this message that China is the cause of all the things that are bad that are happening. Mm -hmm. And you can actually watch it on like U.S. like Gallup polling, Pew Research polling. Right. Attitudes towards China since 2012 have steadily declined, steadily declined. And attitudes in favor of Taiwan have increasingly gone up. And I don't think that's a very mysterious. Most people are not reading technical papers about foreign policy or military planning or anything mm -hmm. like that. They're opening up the paper or they're turning on Tucker Carlson or Facebook, 
Facebook. Yeah, a lot of people get their news straight from Facebook, right? A lot of people get their their news from memes, man. They're, they're memes. like just memes. memes. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I'm I'm not even joking. Like yeah, that's no, how it's people, real. A lot that's of people consume news in this day of age. It's by me. It's but through memes. That's a little. They'll see a meme of Xi Jinping like on a dragon, and like eating the world. We need the poo. And they're like, him. man. Uh, well, yeah, he's winning the poo, and they'll be like, "Oh, this is uh, this is uh, the end. We need to make our stand right now." But I think the U.S. in the United States, and I think this applies to pretty much all Western countries. No one has the appetite for casualties anymore. No, I don't think anyone has the appetite to have, you know, graves with American flags on them, especially young people. No one has the appetite to see a bunch of um, families destroyed through not even just like you know combat death but just the um the the perils and you know the the hardships that um that happen after war such as ptsd and suicides and drug addiction and things like that like i don't think anyone really has the appetite in this country to do that so uh, yeah Ian Bremmer, actually, I follow him on Twitter, and he just released a, a poll. I can't remember. It was, I think it was from their organization, but he actually released a generational breakdown talking about, like, your willingness to go fight a war. And the over 65s, it's like 80 percent of them are like, let's go kick someone's ass. And then the next generation and next generational cohort is like, you know, maybe like 50, 60 percent. But uh, 28 to 18 there is no appetite for it at all. I mean, I'm talking in the teens, percentage wise. And these are the people who are draft eligible. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there's no appetite at all among the actual fighting age population to go have a fight. Who cares if 60 year old guys are, are like, we should go fight? They can't fight. You right. know, the army doesn't want them. The boomers, you know, all of them, the Gen Xers are all too old. You know, it'd be the millennials and the Gen Zers, and they have no interest at all. Right. So I think that's crucial. Unless back in my day, we would have killed <laughs> 60,000 of us for a police action in Taiwan. Mm-hmm. Whatever yeah. happened in these generations. I mean, you can't you can't go we against just the data threw, on this. We would have we would have threw kids in college <laughs> right into that kids who weren't in college right into that meat grinder. But now too many kids are going to college. I mean, you, I, I agree, Joseph. You can't deny that there isn't an appetite for it. I think there's scores of evidence and information around that. But there's always the unless. And well, the unless. There's one in more thing. There's is, one more point I want to yeah. want to say before on appetite for war. Mm-hmm. So many Americans have witnessed the past 20 years of our endeavors in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. It's now just like common knowledge at this point right. that these were complete boondoggle, corrupt, right. horrible, Bullshit. terrible wars that were mm-hmm. sold with lies. I mean, Trump won the election. Trump, one of his biggest moments in his 2016 election was when he was in South Carolina. And yeah. South Carolina is a very militarized red state. Like you may not find a more red, militarized, right wing, get her done type state. And where he said, they lied us into the war. Huge they cheese. lied us into the Iraq war. In South Carolina. That's, that's, that's pretty huge. Like the fact that that was a message that people re- it resonated with, uh, especially among Americans' right wing, America's right wing. So now when people think of Afghanistan— I mean, probably the first thing they think of in Afghanistan is obviously the pullout and, you know, how ugly it looked and it, it did look ugly. And I definitely agree with the critics of Joe Biden that it was not a smart idea to pull out of Bagram before evacuating from the city. However, I think it's good that it was done. But I think everyone has just woken up to that these wars are total horseshit and they're total just transfers of wealth from taxpayers to, you know, to uh, to military contractors. Like, I think that is becoming more and more common knowledge, uh, even across the right wing. However, there's still like this sentiment where, like, I need to fucking blame someone else. I need to blame some external factor for causing all the all the pain. And I also need to have like this partisan hammer that I can smack my political enemies with. That's why China's used so often because mm-hmm. they want to be like, well, look at the Democrats. They're linked to China. They're all just in Xi Jinping's pocket. 
almost exactly how uh, the Democrats were doing it to Republican politicians on Russia, during the Trump administration. They were mm-hmm. like, Russia, 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 Russia. I don't even think they really believe it to some extent. I think they really just use it as a partisan tool. Well, you know, that that, that all incurs a debt, Henry. That all incurs a debt. And when and this is the unless that I wanted to talk about when when, you know, they come to collect on that debt, I wonder if the right actually goes through with it. And the unless that I want to talk about is let's say Biden's, you know, uh, rock solid commitment to Taiwan is act- actually has legs, right? Maybe it's not on paper, but like he actually does have a plan and he sends in a carrier strike group, right? Not to fire the first shot, but just to like flex a dick muscle, you know? And let's say intentionally, unintentionally, false flag, whatever, doesn't matter. Something goes down. You know, one of those carriers has like 5,000 human beings on it, right? That is like a full on 9-11 right there. Dude, you're predict that's that's a scary situation for the world to be in. Right. That is, and that's and honestly, it's not out of it's not something that couldn't happen. Right. It's like it's, it's totally within the realm of possibility. possibility of happening. This these hypersonic weapons that China are developing, and we we did an uh, uh, an episode on on these ballistic missiles, very capable, you know, and they probably could take out something like that. So let's assume doesn't matter how it happens, but the fact is carrier goes down. Do you really think that we're going to remember the pullout in Afghanistan when we're when we've got the names of all of the lives lost in the Pacific due to this bombing? Do you really You're think right. you know do you really think that the right is going to be like, "Oh, I don't want to make good on that debt no, for you, that you're right. I, you know? I 100% agree with you. I 100% agree with you. I think you're absolutely right about that. I think that if 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 an incident like that happened, and I think it it could even be less than that. It could be mm-hmm. 100 troops. Right. 100 sailors who died. Right. I think that that would overtake the uh the lessons learned in Afghanistan and in the Middle East, they would be lost. They would be mm-hmm. forgotten. I don't know. What what do you think, Joseph? Well, that's that's terrifying because I, I actually think that and I conclude my article by saying this, uh, I think that's exactly what's likely to happen eventually um, with Biden's shift from the tactic of strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity, which is crowding the area with potential combatants. It's it's literally like just dumping gasoline all over the apartment and then just flicking random lit matches and like, oh, that one didn't go off. Well, that one didn't go off. One of these is probably just going to go off. And if it's a if it's a U.S. vessel that gets involved with whatever, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, it's, you know, public opinion is as fickle as the weather. Mm-hmm. You know, today they're very sage and have learned all these lessons. Um, I do actually think that's one thing Trump is really good for is he's still really potent, really relevant. Colin Powell died this week. And he just put him on blast. Oh, oh my God, that message just was like, just like, let's not forget else. what a scumbag he is for lying us into Iraq, you know? And it's like, I 100% agree. And I would love for you to keep saying these things because people need to realize, like, that's what Total they dick do. move, but he wasn't, he wasn't wrong. <laughs> no, that's you know? what they will do. Like, they, yeah. the national security establishment has a logic all its own. It that's has right. an institutional incentive structure all its own. And those incentives are not aligned with the best interests of the average American citizen. And unfortunately, the corporate media is closely aligned with all of these major military, industrial, and congressional initiatives. And uh, I think it was, you had uh, Christian Sorensen on. He that's describes right. it as a, as a triangle. Right. It's a triangle. And that's true. It is. It's a triangle. These are all self-reinforcing things. All the money is all tied in together. These interests are all tied together. And... Yeah, if if something really catastrophic like that happened, it's very hard. I I try to picture the American public saying to the you know Pentagon like, well, what were our well, what was our strike group doing poking around Chinese territorial waters? And right. they just they would never do that. No one's gonna ask. They'd just be they'd be blind with anger and mm-hmm. hurt, and there'd be a pride component. Mm-hmm. Like we're the United States, we don't take shit from anyone. Right. We don't care who you are, and I mean it would be bad. It would be bad because you, you could totally just see the the real 
disaster scenario unfolding. And with with Biden's really, really aggressive posture, I mean, it's not even it's I mean, I knew it was going to be bad. I knew it was going to be bad. But like this is way worse than than what I thought it was going to be. I mean, pushing basically I don't these are kind of like minor, you know, minor things like Beijing considers them just like repeated slaps in the face. Right. But like pushing to have Taiwan have its own seat um, uh, with the its its own observer with like the the, um, World Health Organization. That's right. Mm -hmm. Which which like, you know, to us, you know, it's or to like like, who cares? Whatever. Who cares? Isn't Taiwan a country anyway? No. Yeah. But, you know, like Beijing considers these just repeated slaps in the face. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's it's really terrifying. It really is. Um, you just you wonder you do wonder what the American public's reaction would be. And, and unfortunately, even though it was really hard to I mean, we, we know now that I mean, the Taliban offered to surrender. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like a month into the war they were like we just want to give up and the american public never heard about that nope the american public never heard about that but donald rumsfeld said fucking forget it we don't take surrenders we will we'll we'll be done with you when we're done with you and you know so they they control the information it's it's really hard to say what exactly would get out there what kind of narrative would come up how much information we'd actually have about it mm-hmm. but any accident. I mean, there was there was a, an accident. The, the U.S. Navy just released a little tiny bulletin on its website a couple of weeks ago. They had a, they get into a fender bender. <laughs> they had the fender bender. Yeah. But what if what if like so that happened like right in China's backyard? Mm-hmm. What if that had somehow like ruptured something and caused the sub to like, I don't know, blow up. Right. And like this is just a very it's like, OK. I, I mean, within hours of 9-11 happening, we know now that high level members like Paul Wolfowitz, you know, those guys were all talking about like, so how do we get, so this is it. This is how we get into Iraq, right? Mm-hmm. Like they were already talking about this. Stuff, Chomping right? at the bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Chomping at the bit. For, for, for years, they were talking about it. For They wrote a letter urging to Bill Clinton, all these neoconservatives, like, we need to really seriously consider having regime change in Iraq. And in this letter, it's all the talking points that are that were used by the corporate press. It's all the talking points are in, in you know signed by Paul Wolf, like every prominent neoconservative, um, Bill Kristol, who just got destroyed in a debate. I thought Scott Horton was. Is what I said. Scott, I thought Scott Horton was a libertarian, but he uh, definitely violated the nap on that debate. So I don't know how libertarian he is if he violates the nap in a debate. Yeah, he was definitely um, first strike. <laughs> man, that was that was a, a fun a fun thing to be at. But um, yeah, I can see I can see the the U.S. Uh, the U.S. populace being very very hawkish if there were to be an accident but you know i also think about that time this happened maybe what a year and a half ago when the u.s and the russians got into a car accident yeah you remember hearing that in syria syria it just be up in just because it's so fucking crowded there you know how many different armies are up there we covered that that they're a relatively country there's uh there's I commend both parties, like the not the governments, but the literally the soldiers on the ground that got into that accident and had the fucking foresight not to shoot at each other. <laughs> you know, like whichever commanders on both sides were there and they were just like, whatever, fender better, keep it moving. You know, Th- those guys deserve a medal on both sides. Yeah, they don't want to die over some stupid shit in Syria. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I'm sure that most of the guys in Syria are just like, what the fuck are we doing here? <laughs> Defending Al Qaeda? <laughs> Is that what we're doing here? Oh, we're meat shields. Uh, we're here just to, you know, if we die, then that's a pretext to go to war. Okay, that feels real great. That's what they are. The soldiers of Syria, that's exactly what their purpose is. If they die, then we have a pretext to go to war. And in, in Iraq as well. 
I mean, come on, man. What the fuck was that that uh, that contractor who was killed after three weeks of being an American citizen? Not saying that his death isn't less tragic, but that's used as a pretext to kill a bunch of uh, of um, what the not the actual Hezbollah, but the what's the the, the Iraqi Hezbollah brand? Oh shit. Um... Not Hezbollah Lebanon, but the Iraqi Hezbollah affiliate. They kill a bunch of them, and um, you know that yeah, leads know to a, a, a massive protest at the, at embassy, the embassy where mm-hmm. where they're they burning call? American flags, and soldiers are literally fucking scared of death. Like they really like a lot of the guys at that embassy in Iraq when there was this huge protest, they thought they were going to die. Like I've talked to some of them, they're like, "Yeah, I thought we were going to die," and. Um, like they thought it was going to be like a Libya situation where everyone was dragged out and and, and horribly murdered. However, um, Khatib you know, Hezbollah, was, by the way, Khatib Hezbollah. So that mm-hmm. was, I mean, that was a product of, of, uh, you know, this, some, uh, an American citizen dying and no one to this day, no one really knows what happened. Like there's no clear cut evidence that Khatib Hezbollah had anything to do with this guy's death. There's no evidence whatsoever that points at his death. That this contractor, who was an American citizen for three weeks, was killed by an Iraqi Shia militia, and they point all they, they, there's that immediately that was a story, and um, that eventually leads to us at the doorstep of a war with Iran because the U.S. reaction to those protests was to kill their George Washington, basically to kill the most honored, prolific person in that country, the head of the military, the head of their intelligence unit, basically the most popular unifying person in that entire state. General uh, Salami. Salami. Mm -hmm. General Salami, Mm -hmm. who, mind you, was probably one of the biggest enemies of ISIS in the world. He was like one of the, he was the number one enemy of ISIS and Al-Qaeda in a lot of these groups. Um, Yeah, sure. Like, he probably had links to um, Shia groups in Iraq uh, during the Iraq war that led to, um, you know, deaths of American soldiers. But, I mean, that wasn't the pretext of why they killed him. I mean, they killed him on behest of Israel. Um, But it's it's crazy because that almost led to a war because they started launching. They put Iran in a situation where they had to react. That's right. And yeah, and that's in what Iran react clear head. They, they blew up some helicopters. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's scary about that is now that you know the Afghanistan pullout has been completed, um, public attention has totally shifted away from that region. That region occupied so much. The rise of China as an actual serious geopolitical <clears throat> competitor totally got missed by everyone because everyone was so focused in the early 2000s on. The Middle East. And now the eye is off the ball there. And Iran, Iran, who I think Iran is is really an explosive case waiting to happen here. Uh, it, you know, it's just kind of a back burner thing in the minds of most Americans now, because everything is, is so much about China, China, this China, that, you know, um, China. Yeah, it's, it's really it's really shocking, you know, because really we should be exerting a lot of pressure on the administration to do what it takes to get back into the deal. Um, that Trump got out of because there's really nothing better on the table. There's nothing better on the table, and it would do a lot uh, in terms of calming the waters um, because they feel like uh, the Americans were always waiting to stab them in the back, and then they stabbed them in the back. And why should they agree to uh, go back into the deal? Um, it's just well, it's, yeah. it's why very should big. They, great question. Why should they agree to go into JCPOA number two? You know, like that, they have no incentive. Oh, look at then, Biden. He's kowtowing right, right. now. And then, and then Trump becomes president out. again in 2024 and just undoes it again. Right. You know, so yeah. I'm not, I'm but not it's predicting something that's that. not really way. getting a lot of attention. <laughs> right. Yeah. A lot of serious attention when really, I mean, that's that, that really is the point where I think the next war could come from because the Israelis aren't just going to sit on their hands and they've already said that. Um, they've said it repeatedly, even now that, um, Netanyahu is gone, uh, Naftali Bennett has not changed his line. He's, he's just as hard line about Iran and nukes, um, as his predecessor was. 
And while I think there is definitely a a situation under which the CCP would feel like now's the time to go attack and try and take Taiwan, I don't feel like they're under any serious pressing time constraints right now. I think things with with Iran, uh, could and between Iran and Israel, could could boil over much sooner than that. And yet, it's it's very clearly not top of the agenda for the administration. And in part of it is is what Danny just mentioned, which was. It's hard to get them to come back to the deal because, I mean, it's, it's why hard. Why should to, they? Why mm-hmm. should they? Exactly. Because Trump could just come back or some other Republican could come back. And Biden has to watch his political um, right. He has to watch out that he doesn't look weak, like going back to the Iranians. And like he's probably going to have to sweeten the pot somehow to like get the Iranians to come back in because the Iranians are like, well, you broke the deal. So in order to get us to come back to the deal, you got to do something for us. So it's. It's really it's tough to it, it's a tough situation there, and I don't feel like it's getting much attention, but it's something that at least with Taiwan, I feel like the issue is clear, even to most Americans who pay attention, like they're aware of what Taiwan is, they're aware that China wants Taiwan, and China would need to militarily go and get them. And so it's like it's not that confusing of an issue. But the politics and the, the the covert activity and the cyber warfare that, that goes on between Iran and Israel and that that whole situation is just very, very opaque, very complicated. And I think it would be easier to coax the American public into a war over there uh, with Iran than it would be uh, Taiwan. But that's just speculation. I, the, the public polling data on that is, is not super clear, but it just seems like first glance, probably. Unless the thing about Iraq (laughs) or excuse me, Iran is that Iran would just would be I don't think it would be equally as horrific, obviously, with a war with China because China has nuclear arms. Um, But it is easier to rule off the table a war with a war with China because you can just be like, well, they have they have nuclear bombs like we can't do that. Like we just need to like this is civilization we're talking about. Like, who cares? And also there's enough big business interest. There's enough markets, there's enough um, um, business interest that wants access to Chinese markets where, you know, they wouldn't behind be behind a war. I mean, yeah, the military industrial complex is very powerful. However, we're talking about the MIC versus the rest of big business. The rest yeah. of big business is going to win. You know, it's like the Israel lobby is very powerful as well. But the Israel lobby versus like the will of the rest of the world, the rest of the world is going to win and get like their say on something. That's why the Iran deal happened in the first place is because, you know, even though that the Israel lobby didn't want it, the rest of the world did because the rest of the world wanted to have access to Iranian oil. Um, And also to make sure they don't make bombs. That was also kind of important. And also to (laughs) make sure they make bombs. But they also wanted somewhat the rest of the world wants a normal relationship with Iran especially yeah. Asia, mm-hmm. because, I yeah. mean, they get the, – the countries in the east are – I mean, they, they're they importing the majority of their energy, like um, Korea, Japan. Japan, China, Taiwan. Like, if you look at all the major importers of oil, it's it's all it's, – it's, it's like these thirsty countries in the east. They don't want to have a war with China, and I, neither really do European countries. Uh, excuse me, with 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 um, with Iran. So um, I guess I'm forgetting the point that I was trying to make. But I guess the ultimate point is that you can rule off a war with China just because of the devastating, the obviously devastating consequences. With Iran, I mean, maybe there's some people who still think that the U.S. has the capability of winning a war in the Middle East. Those people are probably bona fide maniacs and crazy people because we've actually proven objectively that the united states cannot win a war in the middle east under any circumstance we've lost every war in the middle east um and iran is just afghanistan on steroids Wait, didn't we win desert storm <laughs> yeah but we lose iraq we the american people have lost every war yeah um iran is afghanistan on steroids we're talking about a country with what, like three times the population, just as mountainous, just the terrain is just as bad. And these people will fucking fight to the death. 
if the U.S. if the United States invades. Like the people mm-hmm. of Iran will fight to the death. They will strap little kids, put grenades on them, and throw them in. They will they will have them run into American lines. Like they will kidnap. They will fight. And um, there's a level of like national unity there as well. So they would be it would be a lot bigger problem, a, a lot more of a problem than Afghanistan ever was. Yeah, like the U.S. can effectively probably destroy the Taliban, you know, if they wanted to. But the Taliban is just going to grow back and take over, you know, the countryside and wait for the U.S. to leave and then take back the urban centers when the U.S. leaves. Which is exactly and what I, they did. And Iran, <laughs> yeah. It's just such it's a bigger country. It's it's it just would never it would never work. We're talking about tens and tens. Like, how many soldiers died in Afghanistan? Um, what is three thousand, four thousand, including contractors? I forget the exact amount because we we group in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's like the same casualties. However, you know, there's thousands. It wasn't tens of thousands. It would be tens of thousands in Iran. Like, it would be probably. I think it would be a hundred thousand. It would it would take a hundred thousand soldiers to 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 occupy Iran. It would be a bloodbath. And um the people in America, maybe they don't think that would be the case, but it absolutely would. Surgical strikes has become the motto. Like we could just surgical strike. We could just use surgical strikes. That ain't gonna work in the mountains. That's not gonna work in uh, the Zagros Mountain. Also good luck not, not there. having a ridiculous amount of uh, you know, um, collateral damage. If you're only going to focus on strikes, I don't care how surgical they are. Even the best of our yeah. weapons have killed countless. Yeah, surgical strikes. People. What happened with that surgical? The last surgical strike that we all heard about. That's right. That's oh, right. Yeah, we killed an Afghan ally. We and then like 140 other today. people. You know, Rand Paul. You know, Rand Paul's games. questioning of of Anthony Blinken was just. It was it was exactly the moment that I wish you could just anytime you hear about drones or, you know, surgical strikes. I wish that this exchange would just po- automatically like pop up on anyone's feed or in their heads. Rand Paul asking Anthony Blinken. So was was it was it an ISIS fighter? Well, we're not sure yet. And Rand Paul says, really, I would have thought you'd have figured out if he was an ISIS fighter before you dropped the bomb on him. <laughs> Like it's it's really like that. It really is. It's 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 unbelievable. But of course, it happens all the time, you know. Well, you, they had to do something. Right. To, that's and that's they, really all it was. That it was, was just all. we picked the family to sacrifice. Like yeah. we picked the a person to say, okay, well, whatever. Like good enough. Just pick that guy. He talked to somebody from ISIS K once. Okay, he's ISIS K. Kill him. Kill his entire family. Oops. Sorry, he wasn't. ISIS-K. It was just optics. Like they had, like the Americans gotten hit while they were pulling out, and so like not to look weak, they had to hit back, and it was just irrelevant who they hit. Like, yeah, it's it's pretty and even weird. conservatives were holding that story up. Like, oh, you murdered a family just for yeah. your optics. Yeah. Totally partisan. It wasn't out of any mor- right. yeah. morality. You know, it wasn't because they gave a fuck. It was because it made Biden look bad. However. I mean, those should those stories should come up to light. Well, you yeah, know, it was Trump. Conservatives wouldn't give a fuck. They'd be like, all right, well, whatever. You know, it's, you know, radical Islam. It's the clash of civilizations. And that would have been what the response would have been. Clash of civilizations. Um, I think social but, media is great for that reason, because you, you can't suppress information the way that you could even 10, 15 years ago. Like that yeah. story. That is not something you can just bury anymore because no, that guy but, knew someone who knew someone and they spread the story around and it got picked up and it was impossible su- to deny. You can't suppress it, but you can subvert it by pumping in an equal or greater amount of bullshit. Yeah, you can definitely. Yeah, I mean, information warfare is is definitely going to be very important. And I think that's one of the things that will be crucial uh, in trying to weigh, because Ch- not everything China does is good. Not everything China does is bad. It's an ordinary country. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so you really have to, and that's why I always take anything I, I read or hear about China with a grain of salt until I've had a chance to really look into it. Because, uh, you know, China, on one hand, everyone always plays the the clips of Xi Jinping talking about how China's so strong and don't even dare mess with us because we'll smash your heads into a wall of steel. But he's also said things like, we want to be leaders of global integration. 
We want to help the rest of the world reach the levels of development that China has been able to reach. But like that stuff never gets played. Right. right. You'll never hear mm-hmm. that on the news. Right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really it's really a classic case of, of the, the Thucydides trap here. I mean, China is not asking for a lot at all. Like they want to be regionally dominant. What on what what reasonable objection from the United States could you could you make without sounding like a total hypocrite? Like you dominate your hemisphere. Right. You interfere constantly. You treat everyone's backyard like it's your own. And China's just asking for a little area of influence. And a part of its I mean, Taiwan is like part of China. Like no one disputes that except for like a handful of countries that do that do recognize it's like three countries around the world. Uh, acknowledge Taiwan as its own country, but it's, it's, I forget. There's like one African country, one South American country. I didn't even bother to to remember them because they were not major players. Um, no offense to those countries, but you, you know that, I think. You yourselves know you're not major players. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So it's, it's really a question for me of what, what in, what is the harm of allowing China realistically like cut through all the propaganda and stuff i was just like i said i was watching that 60 minutes australia the other night one of their uh retired colonels who works in their uh military like their own military industrial complex doing intelligence work for for an institution he literally said that taiwan that's just the beginning of world domination the chinese campaign for world domination it's like wow that is a big leap and you didn't even bother filling in any of the spaces in between China unifies itself. Next is world domination. Like, okay. But there's like ominous music in the background. And there's like spliced in like, you know, soldiers marching in front of Xi Jinping and like fighters screaming overhead. And, you know, it's just meant to terrify people. Well, you know, I think well, that the, 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 the in price. In World War II, there was, uh, sorry, oh. but the, in World War II, there was, um, I guess there's propaganda that the Japanese had their own version of Mein Kampf. That was all about like taking over all of the Pacific and then eventually the eastern, uh, I mean, excuse me, the western uh, coast of the United States. I forget what the document allegedly was called, but it was it was used in World War II propaganda when like talking about our war efforts. It's like, you know, the Japanese have a plan to island hop all the way over to California and then they'll be at our doorsteps. You don't want it. Like, well, you know, they're talking about the, the plot of uh, whatever that show is called, the Netflix uh, show. Made in the High Castle. And yeah, and then, yeah, they're talking about that. Yeah. Um, no, no. I Look, barring the nonsense that Henry's pointing out, you know, like with, with like these ruminations of, oh, if they get Taiwan, they're going to conquer the world next. You know, like barring that, what is the harm in just letting them have Taiwan? Like, what is the cost there? And the cost is 51% of their population that doesn't want to be part of China. That's the cost. Just bringing it back to a human level here, you know? Does it matter to us? No. But it certainly matters to them. The question is, how do we get that Chinese money, that China money? Like, how do we start uh, spewing out CP, uh, China propaganda? I think that's where the real money is, like John Cena. Do you want to like like pivot our podcast to be like a China talk? China piece? mouthpiece. Yeah. You know how there's that show China Uncensored. Yeah, I love that show. Let's be the counter of China Uncensored. China censored. <laughs> China is not censored. Let's set up that. Side the name show. of your show implies something that is not even true. <laughs> yeah. No, it's all right. Well, I, I China is a good place. <laughs> YouTube. Yeah, I do. I do feel for the for the the large portion of the Taiwanese who don't want to be ruled by the mainland, and certainly I wouldn't either. But that doesn't mean that I think that the U.S. has any case for interfering. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's an internal dispute, and if if Taiwan is able to hold off the mainland, good for them. I certainly would be cheering for them. But I, I don't want anything to do with it. It has sure. it has nothing to do with us at all. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Yeah, I would say good luck to Ty, to Taiwan, but sorry, Thoughts civil and wars are messy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Civil, civil wars are messy, and we don't want to be involved. 
Oh, I'll that. give you my motto, the my family motto. Did I tell tell you my family motto? I don't think so. I'll I'll tell it to you. It'll be news to the audience. I may have told the story before. So um, my great 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 grandfather. I don't I don't know what level of great grandfather he grandfather he, but he's a far back. Was a soldier in the Revolutionary War, and he. Um, served with George Washington. So there was a book written in like the 70s called Soldiers of the Revolutionary War. And his name was Jonathan Henderson. And he there was a chapter on him about his life and, you know, what he did after the war. And um, there's a lot of in like uh, politically incorrect things in it, which are it's kind of funny to read. However, um, there's a part in it where he talks about how the Hendersons got their family motto. And uh, it's uh Jonathan Henderson once was in Philadelphia and he there was a dispute between a Polish man and his wife. The Pol he got in the middle of it and tried to to help the Polish wo the, the woman and they both tried to stab him. <laughs> that's when Jonathan that's where the Henderson family motto comes. Never get into the never get in the middle of the affairs of a man and his wife. <laughs> Who's this the is man a book that was written in a image. long time ago, <laughs> <laughs> but we found out this guy was like, uh, you know, related to me. So that's uh, that's my family motto now. Never get it involved in someone's domestic affairs. I changed it so it's less uh, misogynistic. <laughs> or PC, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Works yeah, on a political scale. Too. Works mm -hmm. for every type of couple. Um. All right. Um, I think I think we're probably at time, Joseph. I, th I think you've, you've been so graceful as to give us almost two hours of your time. Yeah, here thanks, thanks, with us thanks for joining subject. us. It's a, it's, it's a real pleasure to speak with you. And um, I know our audience really enjoys uh, enjoyed it. You're the last episode you uh, you came on. So uh, we hope to keep on doing this. <laughs> like, you know, we, we love talking to you like our audience loves uh, listening to you. So, um, you know, come on the show. Uh, Whenever you want. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. You got an open invite. Well, thanks, Henry. Thanks, Danny. I, I I really enjoy talking to you guys as well. I think you do great work, as I've said, and uh, the conversations are are great. So, uh, I'll I'll definitely uh I'll definitely try and put something on my on my calendar. Awesome. Can um, you uh, right. tell everybody where you uh, where they can get your information or uh you know your works or anything else you want to plug? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, you can find some of my work at the Mises Institute, the Libertarian Institute, Sage Advance. Um, let's see. My website, uh, jsmwritings.com. Uh, I do have a blog. Uh, I have started putting more things up there. Um, let's see. You can contact me. Uh, there's a contact uh, link there. And I also, my website went down. Uh, the last time I was on, it was kind of terrible timing, but I do have it back up and running. But in the meantime, I made a Twitter. I made a nice. Twitter, and uh, so I've been I've been uh, doing a little bit of tweeting. It's uh, it's okay, it's okay. We'll have to link that in the show notes then. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> awesome, thanks. So, yeah. All right, uh, thanks everyone for listening to another episode. If you want to support the show, you can rate and review the podcast if you're listening on Apple, and um, if you're not listening on Apple, then you can share it with a friend. Um, you can also support us on Patreon, where uh, we have a, a nice community going on. So uh, join us. Join us in our commune. Um, anything else, Danny? Now you're making us sound like commies. <laughs> we are collective. <laughs> we are collective. We are coll yeah. All right. Uh, peace, everyone. We'll see you uh, next week. Peace.